Good morning, everybody. Um, uh, I'm happy to be here uh, at this um, Congress, and I must say I feel uh, a little bit uh, uh, outside my comfort zone. Uh, this is not uh, what I usually do for a living. I do transplants uh, of other organs, so this is a new field, and uh, um, the, the other part of the Congress here of fertility and and so I feel uh, uh, not, I feel like being in the wrong place, but it's very nice to be here. <laughs> and it has been very nice to uh, be part of this project. Of course, when you start on a journey uh, to, to uh, uh, um, uh, put a new technique uh, into a man, uh, there will always be a lot of ethical issues coupled to that. And I remember the first time I, I met uh, Mats, uh, it was one of his PhD students, uh, 2002 I think, and I was in the uh, committee, uh, evaluation committee, and I said to Mats, uh, you know, if you want to do this in a human, you start uh, start working on the ethics because uh, that will be the most difficult part. So um, here is some of the work we have done. Uh, as we already heard uh, Lars uh, mentioning the alternatives to uterus transplantation, uh, maybe uh, the most common is adoption today. Uh, but we already know that adoption is not enough for many women uh, uh, for other causes. That's why IVF um, was launched one. And then we have the gestational surrogacy, which is not uh, allowed in many countries. Some countries do allow it. Um, and... Um, uh, to start the whole process, uh, this has been an ongoing discussion within your profession uh, for a long time, and there are some guidelines. Um, the FIGO uh, in uh, 2009, uh, and they state that it should be uh, preceded by a significant research to be uh, acceptable. Uh, including primates, uh, and also uh, they should uh, look at the options uh, before engaging into this uh, kind of project. And they also state that removing a uterus from a young woman who, who did not complete um, having the desired number of children is unethical. And they also state that live donors is actually out of the question, more or less. Uh, but we still, in our group, juiced uh, live donors for reasons that I will come to later. Um, we learned a lot when we start to discuss how you have to go about um, the, the ethical discussions uh, not only when it comes to new techniques, but also when it comes to other uh, um, uh, different, uh, difficult decisions. And one of the fundamental principles uh, in medical ethics is uh, autonomy. And this means, uh, in other words, the self-rule. Uh, the, the physician must respect the patient's right to make decisions regarding his medical care. Uh, so, which also in the in the uh, in the, in, the, in the, um, following, then it means that you you need to have a competent, informed patient uh, that has uh, the right to choose among treatments, and also to refuse any unwanted medical interventions. Uh, this uh, can cause some problems. But by providing the informed consent and following the patient's wishes, 
uh, the physician actually demonstrate the respect for the patient's autonomy. So this is a central ethical principle. The other basic uh, principle is the non-maleficence principle. This is actually, it means that do no harm. And this is, goes back to uh, uh, the, the um, ethical oath for, for do all physicians. We must refrain from provide ineffective treatments or act with malice towards our patients. This is, uh, uh, sounds, uh, I mean, self-evident, but this is uh, the, the basic principle. And then you have the beneficence principle, the third principle, and this means do good. Um, so the, the, it should be a benefit for the patient. And, and it, it, examples would be to take actions to, to help or prevent or remove harm uh, for the patient. Or maybe simply improve the situation. The last principle is justice and dignity. And the principles of distributive justice deals with issues of treating patients equally. You should treat similarly situated patients in a similar way. There should be no difference. You should allocate your resources justly. And in case of limited resources, you should practice cost-effective medicine. This is the part of that. You should make recommendations and decisions based on ethically pertinent considerations. Uh, but justice and dignity could also be looked upon as uh, the procedural side. And this requires the process for making decisions for patients uh, to be fair and just. This means, in other words, if the patient is not satisfied uh, and wants to appeal, it should be uh, uh, treated correctly, fair and just. And for example, this is very evident for us in the transplant business. Um, you should allocate organs fair and justly to the patient. It should be transparent, it should be fair. So the, the principle of um, justice and dignity, uh, it actually is a base, basic um, uh, right for the human being and with, this means that um, also it cannot be violated by society. Human dignity is the conceptual basis for human rights. So if we have these four principles, how should we, how should we uh, use them? Well, it's, it's a balancing act because you will have a contradictory uh, 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 decisions. Exa uh, example would be balancing autonomy with the beneficence. When the patient's autonomous decision conflicts with the physician's benefit duty, we have the duty to do, the, do good for our patients, then the principle of autonomous choice should be uh, overriding the, the decision of the uh, uh, physician, which is sometimes uh, uh, difficult to accept, but this is uh, according to the rules. And as long as the patient meets the criteria for making an autonomous choice, the patient, uh, that means that the patient understands the decision at hand is, uh, and is not uh, basing the decision on uh, delusional ideas, then uh, we should respect the patient's decision even although we know that it's, it might be wrong uh, for the patient, but we have to try to explain this in a, as good way as we can. And if you have to balance the autonomy and beneficence, when the patient's autonomous decision conflicts with the physician's benefit duty, 
in, uh, uh, in these uh, situations, the autonomous choice of the patient conflicts with the physician's duty of beneficence, and following each ethical pr principle would lead to different actions. But the patient have the right to decline treatment due to their autonomy or freedom to decide. It would be unacceptable and even inhumane if patients were physically and forcefully treated against their will. Uh, finally, if you want to balance the beneficence and the non-maleficence principle, this means that um, uh, uh, th th this balance is the one between the benefits and the risks of treatment and plays a role in nearly all uh, decisions we make for patients. Uh, we have to take uh, into account uh, uh, the effects and the side effects of medication and try to do good. Uh, the informed consent we, uh, we should uh, guide the patients to make the right decisions, of course. Uh, it should inform the patient about the potential risks and the potential benefits in order for the patient to make the right decision. And ultimately, of course, it is the patient who assigns uh, uh, the weight of these risks and benefits, but everybody knows that this is very difficult. We have a, a great responsibility here as a physician. But the principle is that if we want to do something new, uh, it should be more good than bad. And it's quite easy to understand. Apart from these um, fundamental ethical principles that you can find in the literature, uh, in, in, um, uh, not only in, in medical ethics, but also in other parts, uh, parts of ethics, we have the society uh, or the ethical platform of every society. And any society balance the cost for certain treatments in the population, uh, but the, uh, the system differs. This means that uh, uh, very expensive treatments, uh, uh, it's, it's like the, an insurance company for the whole population, and, and uh, it, 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 the healthcare systems obviously looks very different in different countries. Some states, for example, keep a basic selection for the general population, financed through federal taxes, and options, other options uh, the, the patients have to look through on their own through private insurance companies. Uh, United States would be one example of this. Uh, but if you look at, at what, what's usually taken care of is trauma care. Uh, this is covered by most uh, governments. Uh, and also correction of congenital diseases is also uh, accepted as uh, uh, being covered by the state. Other states includes what's uh, in some uh, uh, discussions uh, meant as free health care, but it's not free, of course. It is paid by the state somehow uh, through finance uh, or re regional or state taxes or taxes through employment. So there is a, uh, every country has their own way to finance this. And the Swedish parliament um, has established an ethical pl uh, platform for priority settings considering all care and cure, and uh, have some guidelines for the healthcare society to, to consider. And the parts of this uh, platform in, in include the principle of human dignity, it uh, uh, includes the principle of need and solidarity, and it includes the principle of cost efficiency. So this has to be weighed uh, towards each other before uh, you decide if it's a, a needy uh, uh, ca um, uh, medical care. And if you look at the principle of human dignity, as we've discussed before, uh, uh, the bearing uh, line here is that all people are equal in dignity regardless of the personal characteristics and functions in society. So you should not make differences here. Uh, and this principle focuses on the value of a medical treatment of one patient or a group of patients. The other principle is the need and solidarity. Resources should be committed to the person or the activity most in need of them. 
This means that, um, uh, 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 that it's focused on the value of medical treatment of, of a group of patients, but this value must be compared with the needs for medical treatments of, of other patient groups. And this, of course, needs that you do some type of priority setting or uh, uh, work to do this, and this is uh, difficult. Uh, if it, first, you should do a priority within the specialty, which we call a vertical priority setting. This might be easier to do. Uh, we all know within our own specialty what kind of patients are the most needy to, to treat. It's, this is quite, uh, not so difficult. But when it comes to uh, comparing the need between different specialities, then we start to have problems. This is what you call the horizontal priority setting. And this is when it gets interesting and, 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 and it, of course, very, very difficult because we, we uh, tend to see our own specialties as the most needy. And uh, I'm sure that these uh, priority discussions are difficult in any society or any system. Uh, lastly, the principle of cost efficiency means when choosing between different fields or of activities and measures, a reasonable relation between the cost and effect measured in improved health and improved quality of life should be aimed for. And it's, it sounds as a sound philosophy. So therefore you have to compare a, a certain new treatment with the treatments that are uh, on the field already. Uh, and you have to, to look for uh, what will be the result and uh, how much will that cost uh, and so on. Uh, you should do comparisons with the evidence-based method if they are available. Uh, and, of course, the results here in, in a comparison like this will also differ between states and societies because we don't judge these factors uh, uh, the same. Uh, we talk about an, the um, ethical reflection, and that means that you should include the fundamental principles for the patients and you should also take into account the ethical platform for your, your uh, uh, society or, or your country before you make a decision. And doing so, uh, the new treatment modalities has to be uh, introduced transparently. Uh, not so many years ago, it was much easier to introduce a new treatment. You just did it. But uh, uh, this is not uh, acceptable in most societies anymore. And one way to get some guidance is uh, this uh, uh, article published in Lancet, a series of three papers, where they outline the, the, um, uh, 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 how to go about new innovative techniques and they list uh, uh, different stages so for example when you do the first case it's on a single patient basis it's done uh, uh, it's called the explorative explorative phase and you're allowed to do a certain number of patients on a single case basis but when you have sorted out what you think is the best treatment, you should do a series under, uh, and they should be controlled and they should be transparent. You should publish the data even if the, date, if the results are bad. So by this means, uterus transplantation would be considered being in stage one or two following this ideal concept. We are in an exploratory, uh, explorative phase uh, although we have choose to uh, uh, make it as a series. Uh, and uh, it, therefore it would be a stage two procedure according to the ideal principles. Um, and it was preceded by extensive experimental research, uh, as uh, you, you know, before clinical launch. 
Um, and we uh, choose to construct a multidisciplinary team covering most of the aspects of the proceeding and also the ethical process, which I think is also a strength if you want to set up a program like this. Uh, the time is, um, has passed when you have the, uh, the, the hero surgeons uh, doing everything uh, uh, under the roof. Uh, uh, the results will not be uh, good. And uh, in our case, we had an open ethical discussion both locally regionally and nationally. And, and uh, I must say it was a surprisingly smooth uh, journey. Uh, 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 we gave it time and we, uh, and following these principles, it has been surprisingly easy to get, uh, get it forward to, cl to clinical launch. We have conducted this, as I said, as a clinical trial. Uh, we have safety boards. We have registration of complications, and we use the Clavian Dindo system. For you that are not uh, uh, um, familiar with that, that, it's a very good way to classify how dangerous your complications are, and it's a strength to have these uh, uh, registrations. Uh, um, you can look it up. He, he's, uh, he's Pierre Clavian uh, from Switzerland. He's done a lot of work on this. And, of course, we will publish the results irrespective of outcome. And uh, this sounds uh, easy, but I tell you, uh, I've been uh, doing other types of work, and when you have negative results, it's not so easy to get them published, even if you want. Uh, so the ethical questions, uh, of course, in this case, would be a risk for the mother, would be mortality, uh, morbidity, a risk for the donor, mortality, morbidity, and risk for the child, mortality and malformation. So you we're talking about 300% mortality here if you're really bad, if you're looking for live donors. Um, of course, then you have some risk for the partner, stress, psychology. You have medical cost for society. Um, and if you look, if you do pin it down it, um, uh, more, um, to the different uh, parts, the, the, the risk for the mother, of course, would be the temporary risk for immunosuppression, the low surgical risk known for organ transplantation, the risk for the donor, which we need, uh, use uh, numbers from kidney donation, where, where we have a mortality risk of 0.03%. Risk for the child, there are more than 15,000 pregnancies with the uh, women uh, on immunosuppression. Uh, we have risk for the partners, which we know little about, of course. Um, medical cost for society. Uh, uh, finally, it will be a political decision in line with the IVF, who was not so easy to launch clinically either, if you remember. So this is, if you should take it out on both sides of the line, if you should consider uterus transplantation versus gestational surgery, you have the pregnancy risk, the natural bonding, uh, you have the control of lifestyle factors, you have mother definition illegally, which is not clear in, in uh, gestational surgery, uh, and, and you have the procedure by itself, which is not legal in many countries. And on the downside, you have the surgical risk, you have the immunosuppression, uh, and you have to, to, to get uh, to um, uh, 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 weigh these. And, and for the reflection, the Rokotansky syndrome is considered a congenital, it is a congenital disorder like that, that uh, Lars talked about. And uh, in, in most societies, this would be a, 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 an appropriate procedure to correct. A uterus transplantation will give the same right uh, as other citizens receiving non-life uh, uh, saving treatments. Uh, a decision to proceed with uterus transplantation as standard care should be made on grounds on scientific studies. It will differ from different societies uh, on basis of priority compared to similar treatments within the healthcare system and will most likely be taken by political decision makers in most countries. So in conclusion, uterus transplantation is a new treatment modality includes several complex ethical questions involving at least two individuals, mother and child, 
and in our case also the, the um, uh, donor. It should be performed as a study, uh, follow the ideal principle is our recommendation. It should be performed in an academic institution with transparency and registration on complications, followed by a report. It will have to be compared to other non-life-saving procedures before deciding on priority in the respective healthcare system. So we have no universal solution for this decision-making. Thank you.